This is Creative Banter. While I continue to ramble on about summer doldrums and my lack of direction in life, Ben brings to the table an interesting discussion on the connection between barefoot running and large format photography. We speak on his fears of being forced to digital, perhaps an inevitable fate in time, and why these fears exist in the first place. Will he decide to venture to the dark side of digital, or will he sooner give up photography altogether? Of course, this is all hypothetical. Or so we hope. So I went for a for a ride this morning, which uh, which I've really been enjoying. I, I think it's it's just kind of like when you. I mean, I'm sure you you remember this phase of photography when you get into photography. Everything's new. Everything everything's new. Everything's different, and you're super excited yeah. about everything. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everything's exciting, and you're trying to develop the the various skill sets. And uh, so that's that's what I've been doing with the with the cycling stuff lately. And uh, the latest thing I've been working on is trying to. Uh, improve with the hill climbs, okay. which is like the most demanding part of it. The cool thing is that where I live, there's a lot of hills. So you can choose all these various uh, routes that will put you up some pretty good hills. And I've just been kind of like doing repeats on those hills and, and kind of learning from stuff. So that's that's fun. But I also, I'm, I'm a little bit drained right now because I don't know, I got back like 45 minutes or so ago had had enough time to take a uh, a nice ice cold shower and here we are so <laughs> <laughs> yeah i remember i think i mentioned it before when we had talked about bicycles and all that previously but uh the area around us is nothing but like hills in the nice area like the rural country area that we're in so yeah. every single time that i go for a bike ride it's like you you have to quickly get used to those those hills and yeah, it's rough. And I and I I love the climbing. I, I think it's just because it's it, it it slows you down. You kind of think about every every, every little thing that you're doing, and um, you don't think about anything else. It just kind of takes your mind off everything else because you just focus on what you're doing, which is I guess kind of like the whole flow state when it comes to photography. Mm-hmm. Um, and the the downhills are fun so long as there's a good ability to kind of run out that speed if it kind of transitions into an uphill at some point. Yeah. Um, but there's some, there, there's some downhills where I go where like, you, you can't do that. There's just like sharp corners ahead and all kinds of stuff. So it has me, uh, definitely, uh, uh, being mindful of breaks and, and such, but, but it just, it really has taken me back to that first little bit when, uh, when people kind of get into photography and, and so I've, I've, I've really been enjoying that. I've seen lots of parallels with that. I know that a couple episodes back, I was talking about the the book I had read, um, Born to Run. Yeah, which I actually just picked up the other day. So, oh, cool, yeah. cool. So that is it's working its way through your queue. Probably about twenty five books back or something like that. <laughs> I've got a couple books that I want to read first, but I'll probably be done with it uh, September or so. Nice. It's gonna be. It's towards the forefront because that way we can have a conversation about it, and yeah, so that's good. Um, one of the things that they mention in that book is has to do, and, and I've I've mentioned this a little bit in the past um, when 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 I had mentioned it, but talked about how running shoes have been designed through the years in a way that basically reinforces bad habits mm-hmm. in terms of the way that people run. And so just out of curiosity, I decided to buy a pair of barefoot running shoes and they have, it has just, just enough thickness on the sole so that, you know, if you step on a rock, you're not going to wince in pain, but you're going to feel it. Right. Um, yeah. So you feel everything and you very quickly realize that you have to run completely differently. Um, so you have to land more so on the front of your foot because in the way that people would typically run, if they have, you know, really thickly padded running shoes is that you kind of land on the heel and then you kind of transition towards the front of the foot and then you kind of push off. But you try doing that with barefoot shoes 
and you're going to be in for a world of hurt. Yeah, because um, you have all that pressure right away that's hitting your heel. That's yeah. You don't have anything to pad that to absorb that. And it transfers right up your legs, right to your spine. Yeah. And all it takes is just one or two steps like that. And you're like, oh, no, no, I can't do this. <laughs> um, so it, it very quickly um, kind of retrains you to run more on kind of the, the front of the feet. And then you also at that point realize that you have this really wonderful suspension system built in like with the arch uh, arches of your feet. Then you also learn to be very light as you jog and basically just kind of like slap the ground with the front of your feet. And all of a sudden things get to be a whole lot easier from that standpoint. It's a lot less, it's a lot less difficult on the body, though also it does result in like the calves doing a lot more work and sort of the, your foot is going to be using muscles differently. So those things need to build up a little bit. And, and I haven't gone for any, any longer runs. I've been mostly just, you know, I take the dog for a walk. I'll do like a little bit of a, a, a run here and there. Um, but I, I found it to be a very fascinating uh, little experiment. And it, it got me thinking a lot about photography and about large format in particular. Because I think when shooting with large format, it's a lot like trying to run in barefoot shoes. You very quickly realize what works and what doesn't. And it, does, it, and it doesn't uh, reinforce bad habits. It kind of forces you to, to have good habits in terms of thinking through compositions, thinking through the light, and I've heard people say that, you know, you can do the same thing. You can take the same approach of large format and you can apply it to working with digital. But in some ways, I think that's a bit like saying, you know, you can, you can still run that same way with a traditional running shoe. But I think the moment you have that running shoe on, you're going to kind of fall back on, on bad habits. See, I don't know about uh, that. Like a couple years ago, I think it was before COVID, if I remember right, mm -hmm. I was going through those issues in terms of uh, a lot of getting a lot of shin splints and everything uh, when I was trying to run. Mm -hmm. Even running like a mile, it didn't matter what I was doing. I was just getting shin splints yeah. all the time. And so I start going to physical therapy to try and remedy that. And they had me on the treadmill and they saw I was striking the, the ball of my foot. So mm -hmm. just like you would if you're a barefoot runner. Yeah. They were pretty much saying that that was one of my biggest issues is because I was striking the, f the ball of my foot and my calves are overdeveloped. So I have like my one leg is longer than the other. So my other leg, comp my shorter leg compensates. And then on top of that, my calves are very muscular and they're like way mm -hmm. overdeveloped, likely because of that compensation. Um, yeah. And so that led to a bunch of issues with my running. So I, I don't heel strike when I'm running. I'm like more mid-footed, which is how you're supposed to be when you're running in terms of mm -hmm. shoes kind of deal. Um, but I don't know if I necessarily agree that you would default to running how the shoe is set up or like running to heel striking just because you're in shoes. I think it's, yeah. it might be, I mean, just like with that argument of large format versus digital and using those principles, interlocking them, I think it's possible. If you go into it in the right mindset and you are conscious about what you're doing and you train yourself in that way. But yeah. I do agree that like you go barefoot, it will completely change it. You go shoe, it will be completely different. And it's a matter of like how you approach each each topic. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 obviously there's gonna be all kinds of different other variables at play. But I, I know that even from my own experience, because a while back, um, I don't know, this was late 2020, I had bought the, the digital and my idea was to approach it the same way that I would with film, but it just, it, it wasn't quite the same experience. And although I was very limited in the way I was using it, it just, it was, it was a completely different sort of experience. I didn't feel as involved. Um, and that, the other thing is, as far as like the parallels and stuff with the barefoot shoes, you have so much more sensory feedback in terms of like the feel of the ground underneath you, where you feel more sort of connected to the environment. And in the same way that when working with a large format, you know, I feel so much more 
connected to the subject. And I felt like there was a bit of a separation when I was working with the digital. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously not nothing against digital, but the reason I'm, I'm mentioning all this is I was, you know, you had mentioned a while back in one of the episodes that uh, Fuji is going to be having, they're not going to be taking uh, new orders on, on certain film stocks, you know, including Provia. And, and I have plenty of Provia in the freezer. I have enough for a couple of years, really. Um, but I was curious to see if they had started shipping anything yet. So I went, all the, went to all the regular sources. And of course, no one had any uh, Provia 8x10 in stock. And that started getting me thinking about, you know, there will come a day when I will not be able to buy transparency film, like the right. film that I really, really like. And I don't, I don't see myself as a black and white photographer. Um, I mean, it's just, it's not something that connects with me as much as color. And so I started going through the mental exercise of if, you know, when the day comes that I am not able to buy the film anymore, what do I do? And I, I honestly don't think I'd want to go down to 4x5 if they had that film still available in 4x5. To me, I think once you kind of work with an 8x10, there's, there's something different about it. I think I'd rather do digital than go to, uh, than go to a 4x5. And realistically, um, just, then you're just putting a Band-Aid on a giant wound. Yeah. I and mean, you're yeah, going down to 4x5, the 4x5 hoping will go away. that it's yeah. stock, that film stock is going to actually last even just a few months longer when in reality it's going to be a year at most and then it's still going to go away anyway. Exactly, exactly. Um, and, and I just started, I started thinking back to the experience I had with the, uh, the Sony I had. It, it, it was fine. I didn't have any issues with it. I mean, the quality was good, but I just didn't really have a connection with it. And so I started thinking like if, if that day were to come, I would probably end up buying one of the Fuji medium format cameras and they, yes, they're expensive. The lenses are pretty expensive, but you just get a couple, you know, a couple prime lenses for it that covers the normal sort of stuff that I'd photograph, kind of a, a sort of a normal focal length and a little bit wider than normal focal length. And I'd be set for most of what I do. Um, but then I started doing the math in terms of like, you know, how many years worth of film uh, expense would it take to buy a camera like that? And I don't, I don't remember the numbers right now, but it, 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 it wasn't all that long. Um, but it just, it just, it got me a little sad just thinking about how at some point I will have to make that sort of jump. And I know that I'm going to be pulled into it sort of begrudgingly, you know, it's, it's not going to be something I'm going to want to do just because I have that connection. And it has me wondering if, if I will be able to embrace that medium. I mean, maybe I will, maybe, I mean, sure. Having something lighter and smaller is nice, but I don't know. It just... I just, I just love working with the stuff that I have. And so it's just, it just made me a little sad thinking about that. I think it's one of those things of you have to, it's going to come to your mentality around photography and nature. And is photography that meaningful to you? Like besides obviously the fact that it's your full-time job now, but yeah. that notwithstanding, like, do you like the act of photography more than you like the act of eight by 10? and working with that camera and th that like slight distinction that's there because if you prefer working with 8x10 then it just comes to the realization that more than likely not going to be around for a whole long period of time for the rest of your career yeah so which is unfortunate but yeah i mean unless you start doing wet plate photography but that that goes into um a yeah, ton of a work different ton of yeah. work totally different methodology and on top of that black and white so I think it's one of those things of like, you just have to realize that, I mean, we can adapt to pretty much anything or any circumstance, any uh, method that we choose. It's just a matter of it's going to take time and you need to dedicate yourself to it in order to properly uh, acclimate to that new system. Yeah. I mean, the, the Fujis look great and they look like a ton of fun, like image quality and all of that. And I'd love to go to like a medium format digital option. But they're also beasts of cameras that are just, for most of at least my work, if I were like going to digital, they're probably a hell of a lot more than what I have, would ever need. Yeah, it's just, I don't know. I, I think, I mean, obviously you know this because you work with large format, but I think for the people that are listening to this that 
have it worked with large format. It's so process oriented. And, you know, I hear all the time about um, photographers who feel burnt out in terms of, you know, not wanting to pick up their camera, not wanting to go take pictures, not feeling creatively inspired and such. And I never have that feeling when I'm out in the field working with the large format setup. Um, I mean, the, there might be parts of the trip itself that are a bit of a bummer. Um, but the moment that I'm underneath the dark cloth, working with the camera, working with the subject, waiting for the light, you know, calculating the exposure, you just kind of go into this flow state. And even on the trips that aren't going well, that those are the moments I really do enjoy because I just feel so very connected to the subject and to the process. And I, I know that, you know, with time, I would probably develop some degree of a connection by working with something like the, the Fujis, for example. But it's, I don't know, I don't know, it's just, it, it's, it'll be a tough pill to swallow when that time comes, even though, yes, I would be saving a lot of money in the long run, but it's, it's just, it's different. See, I think you're lucky in that you don't feel that uh, sense of not wanting to take out the camera, of not wanting to create or anything besides having like your first day phones and that kind of deal. Because that's even with a large yeah. format, that's something that I deal with too. Yeah. And I, I question whether it's because I have, I'm putting all of that pressure on myself from the very start of making sure the composition is right, making sure I don't mess anything up while exposing that sheet of film making sure that I don't mess up the exposure itself. And then on top of all of that, the development, I'm just all myself that I'm doing. Um, yeah. The scanning is all on my own. So every single little step is on me, weighing on my shoulders. So there are a lot of times where I'll look at a scene that I would like to photograph that I think would make a cool photograph, but I won't photograph it because yeah. I'm afraid of messing it up or something like that. And obviously that bleeds right into the whole mental health side of my situation where I have that preconditional anxiety coming along. Yeah. Um, so I've given a lot more thought towards digital anymore and trying it again and seeing if it's going to be a better option for me. Um, not because I don't like the process of large format, but more so because of kind of pushing away that anxiety and pushing away that that stress that undue stress for something that's supposed to be wholly enjoyable for me so yeah. plus on top of that there are things that i would like to try to do that um, are much more difficult or really not possible with large format but it, it, it's a bitter pill that you have to swallow eventually unfortunately because unless a bunch of small companies start coming out and making high quality transparency films that which can is a tough thing for sure yeah, that can match what Kodak and Fuji have been producing for over 50 years, 60 years, however long it's been. Yeah. Like, it's, I'm sorry, but it's just not going to happen. It's, yeah, it's going to take a lot of work to even get to, even get close. And so I don't foresee it necessarily happening anytime soon. But now, do you, when, when you work with a large format setup, do you question your, exposure in your composition basically immediately after making the exposure it, are, is that something that you experience at times it depends on the uh it depends on the com the composition the conditions around as well if i know that it's like a high dynamic scene um i'll question it more but i also seem to underestimate the dynamic range of black and white film i mean you're talking yeah. like i think it's 15 stops total, 16 stops of dynamic range in black and white film, which is absurd. Um, so it's nothing that I really actually have to worry about, but mm -hmm. it's still something that is always in the back of my mind of just like, did I actually do this right? And yeah. how is this going to turn out with the chemicals that I'm using, etc.? Yeah. And you have very, you have obviously the other elements in terms of the the variables of the developing and all that sort of stuff versus with my transparency film it kind of it is what it is but i mean i used to after every single exposure i would immediately question my my choice of exposure my choice of composition um whether i had everything locked down on the camera and maybe something had moved like i would immediately question absolutely every decision 
But I think I finally got to the point where I, I don't do that anymore, just from the standpoint that, you know, I just have to learn to trust the judgment that I use because it's the same decision making process that led to so many other images. And it's it's pretty rare that I run into a situation where I just whatever my first instinct is on the scene, whether it comes to composition or exposure, where that that instinct is way off. So I, I've learned just to trust my own sense of judgment and it's nice not to have that feeling anymore. Um, but I, I had that for the maybe the first, I don't know, maybe five, six, seven, eight years or so of working with large format. Like every single exposure, I would just question it. And then it'd make me like want to put another film holder in there and shoot it again. And I'd still question it after that. Yeah, I deal with that. But at the same time, I don't. It's kind of weird. Like I'll question it. And then I like almost immediately start to reassure myself of like, hey, you've done this how many times using the same exact meter, using the same exact film, using the same uh, developer for at least two years now or whatever it's been since I changed that over. And it's like one of those things of like, you've been doing this long enough that you know at least decently well what you're doing in this capacity. So I think I really start to experience those kind of feelings when I go to like Acadia, when I go on my trips to Colorado, et cetera, uh, because then it's one of those deals of if I screw something up, when's the next time that I'm going to be back out there to re-photograph that, let alone the fact that what I just photographed is never going to be the same again. So yeah. I think that's where when it really plays in. Otherwise, around here, when I'm just doing my local stuff, it's kind of like, all right, it is what it is. If I mess something up, then I mess something up. It's not as big of a deal. Yeah. So speaking of which, have you had an opportunity to develop your film from Colorado? Not yet. Um, I've been so lazy this past week. (laughs) I was going to edit last week's episode and have that live by today when we were recording, but that didn't happen. So I'm kind of pushing things off and just, I'm also, I read this sentence somewhere. I don't remember exactly what it was, but you know how you get like the winter blues during the winter time when everything's dead and like just the the seasonal depression starts to kick in i mean i've heard that it exists yeah i yeah i just thought of that you're in (laughs) you're in california you don't deal with that i'm looking at palm trees out the window right now yeah Yeah. exactly (laughs) for everybody else who has to deal with that i sympathize and empathize like (laughs) ben meanwhile just doesn't yeah i'll I'll be staring at palm trees and (laughs) yeah ben's read about it in those books and thought is that real (laughs) i thought it was fiction yeah (laughs) exactly anyway Someone described the essentially seasonal def- seasonal affective disorder can take part any time of the year. It can take. It, it's most commonly known during the winter months uh, when everything's dead and just meh. It's dreary weather, but you can also have it during the summer. Um, and someone called this uh, the summer doldrums, and I just thought that was a beautiful phrasing of of it. And I'm definitely experiencing that right now because I'm. Like my girlfriend just started at her new teaching job. She just started going through some of like the training and that kind of stuff that she needs as being a first teacher or first year teacher at this district. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I wake up with her around like six, six thirty, whatever it is, and then she leaves around seven thirty, eight o'clock, and until three thirty when she gets back, it's just me at the house because my sister's working now. My parents are both at work, obviously, and it's just me and the dog. And I'm like, so what do I do with my time? <laughs> and yeah, until I figure out exactly what I want to do in terms of jobs, and I've obviously been putting applications out as I try and figure that out. But nonetheless, like, I'm just sitting around, and it it's going back to how it was when I was in college during, especially the, during the summer months, but where I just don't know what to do. And yeah. um, well, especially since you had such a very busy schedule, you know, leading up to this. Exactly. And now all of a sudden things just like shut off. And now it's kind of like, I have all this time. I feel like I should be doing something, but what should I be doing? Yeah. It, I, it doesn't yeah. help too when, like, so my job for uh, Nature Photographers Network is literally to send out emails. I was just um, drafting interview questions for our one of our interviews for the second edition of the magazine. Um, mm-hmm. 
I'll be receiving tomorrow another coffee table book to do a review of. But other than that, and like reading, reviewing articles to then send over to a copy editor, it's, it's all a lot of computer work that doesn't feel like work. And I think that's where I'm struggling yeah. right now. It's like yeah. I'm doing, I may be doing stuff and I may have what some people could see it as like a productive day. But at the same time, I'm like, it doesn't feel like I've done anything at the end of the day. And so it, it, it's one of those like really weird, really weird feelings. I've, I've heard some people say that one of the things that they do in that situation, I haven't done this, but I see how it could be very satisfying is to have a whiteboard and to like write the things down and then just take the satisfaction of just like crossing them out or, or erasing them. Yeah. I do. You know, when they're notes. done. Yeah. How, has, has that, it, has that felt beneficial at all? I did it, um, between or before Acadia and then between Acadia and Colorado, I was doing it where each morning or so I'd put down like three things that I have to get done, cross them off real quick. It could be real quick, easy things. Um, and it, yeah, it was definitely beneficial to be able to do that and to have that action of like, okay, cool, that's crossed off. I accomplished something today. Um, yeah. Kind of like a mind trick. But I haven't done that recently. But it's like, at the same time, there's stuff that I have to get done for the magazine. But it's also weird because with this issue, we've hired on additional help. We have mm -hmm. two two other people that are working with us now. And so like my job has been kind of parceled out a bit. Um, so I don't have all the responsibility that I used to. So now it's like, mm -hmm. all right, I got to find other things that I have to do. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can re relate a little bit to that because I mean, this is the time of year where it's between my trips. I'm done with the, all the video stuff from the spring summer trip. Um, my fall trip is going to be in mid October and I have, I mean, I don't have a lot of stuff to do right now, but I do need to start getting to work, uh, producing the prints for the print portfolio this year. But I also know that, I mean, each in one day I can crank out enough prints for one particular image that's going to be in the portfolio. So it's basically a week's worth of work to produce all the prints. And to like, you know, cut them and flatten them and, and everything. And I have, you know, uh, you know, I have many, many weeks ahead of me. And so one of the things that I've been doing as we kind of talked at the beginning of this episode is that I've just been filling a lot of my time doing like the cycling stuff because that's really like for me, like good thinking time. Mm -hmm. And if, if I had an abundance of free time, but I did not have the ability to be physically active, that would be kind of like torture to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so like for me, the fact that this is sort of the uh, quiet time of the year, um, the fact that I can get out and do things, I think that gives me that feeling of being productive and like physically doing something that I don't get by, you know, responding to emails or doing whatever sort of computer stuff that otherwise, you know, I, I am doing this time of year. Um, so maybe, I don't know, maybe it's time to start hitting up the gym even more, you know, something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah. I got to figure out the whole gym situation because of her going back to work, like whether she plans on coming with me after she gets back and we'll pair it up like that or yeah, be especially because she's going to be doing, um, she's a field hockey coach as well. So it's one of those deals of like, all right, so she's not going to get home some days until like at least five after practice later if she has a game. So, yeah, so that schedule is going to kind of shift around and be kind of later at times. Exactly. So I think it's one of those deals of for at least until field hockey ends and she starts coming home right after school and then we can go to the gym together. I think it's one of those deals of like, I'm just going to have to go by myself because like you said, I am just craving exercise, like craving yeah. something. I mean, today I went on, uh, I just went on a walk for an hour or yeah, about an hour and started to clear my head a little bit, came back, felt better, but it's still like, I need something more like, yeah. And that's why I'm really contemplating trying to figure out, I'm really trying to figure out what exactly I want to do for a job between now and next year. If I decide to start applying for teaching jobs or whatever ends up happening, like, do I want to do something that's more physical because it's more rewarding or do I want to 
give this a few more weeks and really just push photography wise and then go get a part-time job somewhere and try to supplement both but i don't know yeah it's tough that's a a tough point in one's life because there's there's so many potential paths that one can take and it's it's never really abundantly clear in terms of of which way to go um so that's yeah that's 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 going to be some some uh some decision making uh and ahead of for you especially because of the fact that i love the freedom of working for myself <laughs> like yeah and you've I'm, had I'm a taste of that i'm a lot so of people addicted. haven't had the taste of that i'm so addicted yeah. to that anymore like i've been working with npn for a little bit over a year now and of course i had i was going through school and everything at the time so it was easier to juggle because of that but now i'm like i really enjoy just working for myself and being able to split my day into chunks where in the morning, I do one thing. In the afternoon, I do another. And then in the evening or whenever I feel like it, I can just take a full day if I really wanted to and play video games. Like as long yeah. as my work still gets done, then it still gets done. So it's that makes it even like so much more difficult to have that taste of freedom even for a little bit and then be like, all right, time to go back and work for someone else. Exactly. Yeah, I would have a real tough time with that. I think, I mean, just... In, in the time that I've been doing the photography stuff uh, on my own, so basically since 2020, um, I just, I, I mean, I, I'm glad, I'm really glad that things have worked out uh, as they have. Um, but I think I'm, I, I, would, I would make a very poor employee at this point. <laughs> <laughs> once, you, once you have that taste of, of, you know, being able to support yourself and, you know, all the pressures that come with it. But um, once you have a taste of that, um, it's, it is tough to go back. There's a story. Let me see if I can pull it up on my email real quick. Um, there was a British postal worker, um, named Anthony Trollope who he, before he'd punch into work, he would be at his writing desk and he'd write a certain number of pages each day. He was an author, mm -hmm. but even when, after he found a bunch of success through his writing everything he continued to work at the post office and putting in hours there and he just enjoyed the that juxtaposition and having like two sides to his life in that way and i'm kind of thinking like i would like to have that if anything at all if not being able to work for myself for now and yeah. having to go back that's kind of why i'm leaning and have been continuously leaning toward just applying at this camera shop by me seeing if i can't work like even if it's three days a week like at least to get that steady paycheck and supplement it off to the side with photography yeah. um, and just see what happens there. So that's yeah. probably going to end up it, being the path that I take and just hope that I enjoy it. And if I do, then bump up my hours and see how those two sides of my life kind of uh, combine. Yeah. And obviously that worked out really well for me because, I mean, that's basically what I did for, for such a long time. Um, I think it really depends on having an uh, employer that's very flexible and that is going to work with people's schedules because you know I, I take off on a trip for you know a week or two at a time mm -hmm. and it worked out really well for that um but i know that i was very fortunate with that and for many people that may not be quite as flexible as of, of a setup um so yeah it really does depend on a case-by-case -case basis yeah i think my luck with this this shop in particular is for the past year or so, they've been looking for the same position. So, of yeah. course, that, that leads to questioning of, like, are they too demanding in terms of what they want? And that's why they can't fill it. Are they not paying uh, a, a livable wage? And that's why they can't fill it. Or is it just that no one wants to work at a camera shop in the back room or selling cameras all day or trying to? I think just all, pretty much all employers in general are just having a really hard time hiring. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I could see that being one of the primary things, um, just, just because, you know, the, the economy is, is changing a little bit more people are able to, um, work from home, kind of do their own thing. And some of the traditional, you know, retail type positions are, you know, rather difficult to, to fill. So I, I don't imagine that's a big chunk of it. Um, but, uh, but you know, who knows? Then another thing um, that has happened with me in the past, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks or so, is uh, I ended up having to do a rather sub 
substantial repair on my wide format printer. Um, so I was doing some uh, test prints uh, for uh, basically proofs for the upcoming portfolio. And I was getting just a hair of banding. And I kept trying to figure out what it was coming from because the, the nozzle test patterns were looking fine. But eventually I found that there was a, a stubborn light black uh, nozzle that was acting up just enough to, to cause trouble. And uh, so I had to have the print head replaced on, on that printer. That sounds like fun. And yeah, they, and Epson doesn't make it easy. They basically make the repair tech tear open the printer, kind of tear off uh, so many of the large exterior pieces and then some of the internal stuff to get into it and then replace it. It was about, it was just shy of a $1,600 part. And then labor was a few hundred bucks. Um, and then with some other expenses in there as well. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a couple thousand dollar repair. Um, but it's, it's up and running again. But when that was happening, I started doing the math in terms of it's some, I mean, I've had this printer since 2019, which it gets a lot of use and it's considered to be, to have had a pretty good life so far. Um, and this is kind of the biggest expense that comes with it. But I started thinking about, you know, at some point, you know, what's, how much is it worth to put money into the printer to keep it going versus at some point buying a whole new printer? And I think this printer was, I think I paid about $3,500 new for it. Um, but these things, if, if people listening to this aren't familiar with the wide format printers, this, this printer is 200 something pounds. It, it's a big, heavy printer. And it's one of those things where when something happens to it, you know, it's, it, it, it makes sense to fix it because it, it just seems like such a waste in terms of, uh, such a large printer and you know to just toss it over something that can be repaired but the repairs are also pretty expensive and that's that's everything today though isn't it i know right that's a whole other conversation and like not at all something to touch into in this one i don't think but nonetheless like that whole idea of you can't repair any like so my phone to make a quick analogy here my phone stopped charging properly and it's a iphone 13 so i just had it i just got it maybe two summers ago something like that um and it stops charging for the most part except if you have the cord in a very particular way and i take it over to at&t and i'm like hey what can i do about this because i have insurance on the phones and they're like hey make a claim or whatever so i go through and i get through the steps of making a claim on it and they say, okay, well, we're going to send you a new phone and you have to pay about $300 as part of your deductible on this. I'm like, this phone works fine. Like there's, yeah. there's nothing else wrong with this phone except it's just not charging, like it, whether it needs to be cleaned or a new charging port and just like the unrepairability of, of anything. Like everything is yeah. just throw it away and buy a new one. It just like, leads to so much stuff just being thrown away for just not really that big of an issue, which it just, I don't know. It just, it, when you just think of how much stuff is being thrown in landfills, yeah. not recycled, but just being thrown away, it just leaves a bit of a bad taste in one's mouth for just how our society is in that case. Yeah. I mean, I took it over to the local, like uh, you break, I fix or whatever it is, whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, who would have handled the repair anyway, took it over there. I'm like, explain the situation to them and what the claim was going to tell me if I had gone through with it. And they were like, oh, well, let, me, let us check it out. It's 30 bucks to do a cleaning quick. We'll clean your speaker ports and all that kind of stuff. We'll make sure everything works. If the clean doesn't work and it's no longer charging, then we'll, we won't charge you for it. And then we can go through with a claim, whatever. And they take yeah. it in the back, they clean it out and it's, right as rain so it's like yeah but it's it's just one of those things of like if i hadn't made that initiative to go there and spend even that little bit about amount of money or waste that time to go there and see what they say then i would have been just throwing out this phone that's perfectly fine like yeah i could charge it wirelessly because it has that mag safe like chi compatibility whatever but at the same time i'm like why can't i just fix it yeah 
And at some point, so the printer I have now, it's a, um, it's an Epson P7000. And at some point when I do hit another expensive repair on it, I think by that point, it'll be closer to the end of life of the printer. Cause it'll, I'll probably get another three, four, five years out of it or whatever. Um, but I think when I, when it comes time to replace it, I think I'll probably replace it with one of the Canon models. Um, because my, my printer can take 24 inch wide paper, but the, there's a Canon, uh, the pro 4100, which can take the 44 inch paper, but it's only the printer is only, I think like eight inches wider than the printer I have. So it's not that much bigger, but it can take bigger rolls. But with that Canon printer, the print heads are user replaceable. Okay. So you could, you could just buy them on B and H, drop them in there. And then you're up and running again without having to have a tech come over and tear it apart. And so I do appreciate that sort of design when it comes to uh, companies thinking ahead, just because it, you know, it's, it's not going to sell them necessarily more printers in the long run in terms of like people being able to, people having to buy a new printer, you know, just because they're the one could be fixed. So in that sense, they might be shooting themselves in the foot a little bit. But when people realize the value of a feature like that, I think it'll sell more printers up front. Um, Cause it's, even though it's an expensive part, it's about a $700 part. It's not a $1,600 part. Yes, yeah, $1,600 <laughs> and, plus having someone come out to fix it cause you can't do it yourself. Exactly. Yeah. Plus the downtime to the point where you could just have that, uh, maybe have one of the print heads just sitting there waiting. And also I think it would give the flexibility to, um, to pull it out and maybe give it a physical cleaning uh, in a way that is not necessarily recommended by the manufacturer. But if your next step is going to be to replace the, the print heads anyways, might as well pull it out, see if you can give it a good cleaning. Um, I will say that I, I was able to keep the print heads for my printer as a bit of a souvenir. <laughs> and it, it's kind of fascinating to look at. Um, but I think I did figure out what the issue was with the nozzle. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, ink that was kind of uh, dried on the print head, kind of uh, not on the print head itself, but kind of along the edges, kind of the borders, I guess you would say. And it's a really sticky, tacky sort of ink. I did see a couple cat hairs in there. Um, <laughs> So, and it's nothing I would have been able to clean because I wouldn't be able to get to it. Um, but it does definitely give me uh, some ideas in terms of the future, uh, in terms of other possible ways of, of cleaning it. But I don't think it may have been the cats that, uh, that led to this expensive repair. So, you know, they're, you know, what can I say? <laughs> I hope you enjoyed our creative banter. You can learn more about Cody's work by visiting his website, CodySchultz.com. And you can find my work at BenHorn.com. For further discussion, join us at Patreon.com slash Creative Banter. It's a place where we can interact with you, the listener. And although we greatly appreciate those who contribute by joining a tier, discussions are open to everyone whether you're a pain member or not. Thanks so much for listening, and we'll see you around next time.